Hello, and welcome to this breakout session on Ending Slavery is Everyone's Work, part of the Ignatian Family Teaching for Justice. My name is Jennifer reyes Lay. I am the Executive Director of U.S. Catholic Sisters Against Human Trafficking, and I am so thrilled to be able to share with you today um, about our work to end human trafficking and support survivors of trafficking and to see how we might be able to collaborate together. I would like to begin with prayer. Uh, one of the beautiful things about our Catholic tradition is that we have a patron saint for pretty much everything. Um, and so when it comes to human trafficking, we do have a patron saint for that, St. Josephine Bakita, who herself was a survivor of human trafficking. And so let us begin by centering ourselves in prayer to St. Josephine Bakita. St. Josephine Bakita, you were sold into slavery as a child and endured untold hardship and suffering. Once liberated from your physical enslavement, you found true redemption in your encounter with Christ and his church. O oh, Saint Bikita, assist all those who are trapped in a state of slavery. Intercede with God on their behalf so that they will be released from their chains of captivity. Those whom humans enslave let God set free, provide comfort to survivors of slavery, and let them look to you as an example of hope and faith. Help all survivors find healing from their wounds. We ask for your prayers and intercessions for those enslaved among us. Amen. So Pope Francis has been a great ally in speaking out against this crime of human trafficking. And I think he offers us a very powerful image to root ourselves in as we reflect on this horrific crime that again is happening in our communities and all over the world. He says that human trafficking is an open wound on the body of contemporary society, a scourge upon the body of Christ. It is a crime against humanity. And so I invite us to just hold that image with us today throughout this session of this wound that is harming the universal body of Christ, the one family to which we all participate. And so we remember, as St. Paul said beautifully in his letter to the Corinthians, that when one part of the body suffers, all parts suffer with it. And so we are all impacted by human trafficking to different degrees. And so we all have a responsibility to address this and relieve this wound, to heal this wound that's impacting the collective body. So I wanna begin um, with just going over some of the basics of what is human trafficking? Who does it impact? Why is it happening? And then towards the end, I'm gonna share a little bit more about our organization, US Catholic Sisters Against Human Trafficking and how we might be able to collaborate together on this important issue. So human trafficking is modern day slavery. It's using force, fraud, or coercion to obtain labor, commercial sex, or organs, right? This is a serious crime and it is illegal all over the world. Despite the fact that it's illegal, every year more than 40 million men, women, and children are trafficked. So this is a huge issue that's impacting all of our communities. And it's a crime that often remains hidden because of the shame that goes with it, because of the physical abuse, the sexual abuse, the psychological manipulation that makes it very hard often for um, survivors to speak out and get help. And it happens often sort of in the shadows. Um, and so we might not even realize it as we go about our day-to-day -day business. So 
So there are different types of human trafficking. And there are sort of three main categories that are understood within human trafficking. The first is sex trafficking. And this is probably the first one that might come to mind. It's usually the one that most people are familiar with or have heard about because it tends to be in the news more than some of the other types of human trafficking. So sex trafficking would be when any person is manipulated or forced to engage in sex acts for somebody else's commercial gain. They are being held against their will, again, by these three key legal words, force, fraud, or coercion. Oh, one more thing I wanted to say about sex trafficking, I think it's important to know from a legal standpoint as well, especially as many youth are attending this conference, um, any commercial sex act involving a person under the age of 18 is considered sex trafficking. So that's important for us to remember as well. The second major category of human trafficking is forced labor. And this is when victims are forced to work for little or no pay, again, under the threat of violence, force, fraud, coercion, um, often manufacturing or harvesting the products that we use and consume every day. And so it's incredibly important as part of this work to end human trafficking is to know and be really informed consumers where are our products coming from? Who is making them? Are they getting paid fair wages? You know, what kinds of conditions are they working in? And to demand from the suppliers that they use um, fair trade standards, that they are ensuring that there is no slave labor in their supply chain. We can demand that as consumers of products. Finally, the third type of human trafficking, um, which makes up the smallest percentage of human trafficking, um, but is still certainly a major issue, is organ trafficking. And this could be either the recruitment, transport, transfer, harboring, or receipt of living or deceased persons and their organs by means of threat, force, or coercion. Within labor trafficking, there are a few other sort of subcategories that are important to highlight. And so you have bonded labor, which would be where an individual is told that they have accumulated a debt and in order to repay that debt, they have to work it off. And so this could be, um, we often see this happening most with foreign nationals who are brought to the United States. And so they're told, okay, you have to work off the debt that you've accrued by having us bring you to this country and then house you and feed you, even though oftentimes the housing conditions um, are horrible and people are packed together, um, that you have to keep working until you can pay off this debt. So they're not actually earning any money. And the way the system is set up is they will never be able to repay what um, the person holding them says their debt is. And so this is a type of bonded labor. Then we have forced marriage, um, which is pretty obvious what it sounds, you know, uh, children or women who are forced to marry without their consent or against their will. And we can often think that, oh, maybe this is just something that happens in other countries, but it does actually happen here in the United States as well. And there are still laws on the books in many states <clears throat> that allow children um, to be married under the age of 18. And so this is an important issue for us to continue to look at locally as well. And then finally, domestic servitude. Um, this would be that the victims of trafficking are forced usually to work inside of somebody's home, perhaps as a nanny or a housekeeper or other type of domestic help. Um, without the option to leave. Oftentimes their um, traffickers, you know, the people who are holding them will withhold their legal documents. And so they're unable to leave or to seek work elsewhere. Um, they'll pay them minimally, if anything at all. Again, it could become a situation of bonded labor where they say like, oh, well, we'll provide you, you know, free housing and food, but then you have to do all of this work for us. Oftentimes in these situations too, there is violence um, or threat of violence in order to keep them there and not leave. <clears throat> 
Okay, so who is who, who makes up these victims of human trafficking? I wanna invite you just to take a moment uh, to picture in your head, what do you think of when you hear somebody has been a victim of human trafficking? And as you hold that image in your head, I want you to think about what's their gender? What's their race? What age is the person that you're imagining? What's their physical appearance look like? Okay, so hold that image in your head. The reality is that victims of human trafficking make up every single demographic that there is. There is no singular uh, characteristic of a victim of human trafficking. Um, while certain conditions put people more at risk, which we'll get into on the next slide, um, there are people who are trafficked who are of all socioeconomic um, classes. There are people of all genders. They are people of all ages, all races. They make up both um, foreign nationals and US citizens. They could be um, homeless or runaway youth people of all sexual orientations, migrants and refugees are particularly vulnerable. People with addictions and mental illness um, are often taken advantage of by traffickers. And so it's important as we engage this work and particularly for those of you um, who are in high school or college or work in those settings um, to know that the person sitting next to you could actually be a victim of trafficking without you maybe thinking that or knowing that because we hold a certain stereotypical image maybe from the movies or even from sensationalized news stories about who a victim of trafficking is. Um, but oftentimes victims of trafficking still continue to go to school um, while they're being manipulated by their traffickers or pimps. And so um, we all need to be aware and attentive of, you know, have there been changes in behavior? Um, is somebody suddenly, you know, come into some new money? Um, you know, have they been gifted a lot of very expensive items by a new boyfriend? There are certain signs we can keep um, aware of and attentive to because oftentimes we might not think um, that the person next to us or the person in our community that we engage with is being trafficked when they really are. Right, so some of these risk factors, again, um, recognizing that trafficking victims span many different demographics, there are certain conditions um, that put people at greater risk. And so when we look at the trafficking of youth, particularly for sex trafficking, um, we find that it can be common for people who have been bullied, um, people you know, who maybe have low self-esteem, who are looking to fit in, or they are um, more susceptible to having somebody come up to them to earn their trust, um, to treat them well, only to then exploit them. Um, you know, sending messages with sexual content or graphic photos um, can be one way that then people hold on to those photos or that content, threaten to share them with others if this person doesn't perform the sex acts that they demand with the people that they demand. Um, that can be one of those forms of force fraud or coercion. Um, making friends with and meeting up with people that you don't actually know in real life, that you've met through the internet, through apps, um, unfortunately, it's very easy today with all of the different apps, as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, to create fake profiles, right? And to create this whole fake persona online um, that doesn't accurately reflect the person that you're talking to. And so <clears throat> being very educated and aware of, you know, safety when it comes to online and um, <clears throat> app interaction. Certainly the use of pornography. <clears throat> excuse me, um, is a huge factor in pushing the sex trafficking, particularly of youth. Um, you know, it's, there's a lot of studies that psychologically, it changes the way our brains work. Um, and so it sets people up to expect certain types of violence in their sexual encounters. 
um, that wouldn't otherwise be there. Um, Oftentimes, both on the sex trafficking and labor trafficking side, but oftentimes more on the labor trafficking side, <clears throat> a person's um, migratory status, or if they're a refugee, fleeing natural disasters, internally displaced person, all of this contributes to their vulnerability to being taken advantage of by a trafficker. Usually a person who's in transitory status does not have a job, um, and so they probably don't have a lot of money on them. They might be traveling with family members. And so they're desperate to be able to buy food, to find shelter, um, and are more easily taken advantage of by somebody who comes to them with a solution that, oh, I have a great job for you. Um, you know, all you have to do is, is come here and trust me. Um, and it ends up being a situation of trafficking you know, or for a lot of women or children, they get taken advantage of by saying, you know, they're very desperate um, in a situation of poverty, of transitory status. And so they are um, sexually abused and or tricked um, into becoming victims of, of sex trafficking. So we see how these um, social justice issues are interrelated, right? That as we work for just immigration policy, as we work to increase the number of refugees that we're accepting into the country, as we work to uh, decrease the violence that's happening around the world that's pushing this, as we work to uh, combat climate change, right, which is creating all of these climate refugees who are then in this precarious situation, vulnerable to traffickers. All of this is connected and is going to have an impact on reducing and hopefully eventually eliminating human trafficking. All of these issues are together. And so when we talk about, you know, what are the systems that we need to break down and what are the systems that we need to build up, right? We need to break down all of these um, paradigms that say that I can exploit another person for my own benefit, right? That are rooted in systems like capitalism and patriarchy and racism that see these different bodies as commodities that can be bought and sold and used and exploited. That's what we want to tear down. And what we want to be building up are communities and systems that uh, recognize that we're all part of this interconnected web of life, that what happens to one impacts the whole, uh, including the whole of creation, not just the human family. And so we wanna be building up these communities that promotes the inherent dignity of every person, that promotes the rights of every person to um, live in freedom and to pursue their goals. Okay, so we focused a little bit on, you know, who are some of the potential victims of trafficking. Now I want you to do sort of the same exercise and take a minute to think about who are the traffickers and buyers? So in your mind, again, kind of first thought, imagine who's the person you're thinking of when you think this is a trafficker, right? Or this is somebody who's a buyer of a trafficked human being. Again, think about what's their gender, what's their age, what's their race, Again, the reality, um, the sad reality, is that they can be anybody. Um, there are certainly demographics that make up larger percentages. So while there are traffickers who are both men and women, um, men do make up the overwhelming majority of both traffickers and buyers. Oftentimes, a lot of the women who are traffickers were first trafficked. Um, and through years of trauma and psychological manipulation, they have now been groomed to bring in other young women um, to be trafficked. And so oftentimes that's the dynamic we see with women who end up being traffickers. Um, they can be all ages. Unfortunately, there are children under the age of 18 who are trafficking other children. Um, and there are older adults, um, you know, who are still trafficking or um, are buying these services. 
Unfortunately, one of the really sad realities, I think, is that it is much more common for somebody to be trafficked by a family member than to be kidnapped off the street and trafficked by a total stranger. Um, that's kind of what we see more sensationalized in the media and especially in movies. Um, but the sad reality is that most people who are trafficked, especially trafficked as children, are trafficked by their family members. Um, and so that's something for us to be aware of, to, you know, to pay attention to who's in our community and what are the family dynamics that we're witnessing. They can also be trusted friends or classmates. You know, again, as I mentioned, um, that it's, it's more often than not people who are known. On the buyer end, um, there are certainly, you know, business professionals, um, the overwhelming demographic that we see on the buyer end is wealthy white males. Um, and so when we talk about how ending slavery is everyone's work, um, we really want to engage with the men who can reach other men, knowing that um, what pushes this is the demand, which we'll focus on a little bit later too. But if we can have these hard conversations with our peers and our friends, um, you know, we can really make an impact. And so we need men to be partnering with us on this issue. We certainly see that, you know, those again who have wealth and power take advantage of that um, by <clears throat> engaging in sex trafficking um, and or labor trafficking, you know, for those who maybe work for wealthy companies um, and are trying to maximize their profits, um, which is disgusting uh, to think about maximizing profits off of slave labor, but that is happening. And then there are certainly still those who are part of gangs and organized crime syndicates um, who are engaged in these trafficking rings. But again, that's not actually what we see most often, um, and especially talking to survivors and working with survivors of human trafficking. Um, that it's a much smaller percentage of those who were trafficked by this really organized crime syndicate versus they were trafficked by somebody who they thought was a boyfriend or a trusted friend or a family member. Um, politicians are certainly complicit um, in, in this. Again, you know, it kind of makes up all professions across the board. Um, there are doctors who have been convicted of trafficking um, and certainly religious leaders. I'm sure we all see in the news far too frequently um, that leaders of all different church denominations uh, have been complicit in sexual abuse or sex trafficking. And so again, this is something that impacts all these different sectors of society and calls us to be extra aware and vigilant um, in order to help prevent human trafficking and recognize the signs so we can report it if we do suspect cases of human trafficking. Just briefly, um, a few of the ways that people are contacted, you know, or tricked into human trafficking. Um, as I mentioned, certainly the internet and smartphones, you know, all of these apps are very easy ways for traffickers to connect to people they otherwise wouldn't have access to, to build up trusting relationships on the labor side, certainly to put out false job opportunities um, that draw people in and then take advantage of them. Um, so, you know, being really smart and educated about what we're seeing and engaging on the internet or on our smartphones um, and talking to our friends about it as well is so important to help educate um, and in order to be safe, to, to help prevent the likelihood that, you know, me or my friend will become a victim of human trafficking. Um, and then certainly too, you know, just observing public places that um, youth and young adults like to hang out, you know, on college campuses, in the local bar, um, fast food restaurants, coffee shops. The thing with traffickers is that they're very smart um, and observant in being able to pick out who's somebody they might be able to uh, manipulate and take advantage of. And so again, just being aware, um, you know, talking to our friends about it noticing differences in behaviors, um, really looking out for one another as part of our responsibility as this one body of Christ. Right, so why does human trafficking even exist, right? I think sometimes we like to think that we ended slavery a few hundred years ago, 
Um, this shouldn't be happening in the world anymore. But it's a profit motive. Um, it's an extremely profitable crime and business. Every year, human traffickers are generating around $150 billion. And, you know, this is because of the economic system in which we live, that you can um, sell a human person as a commodity over and over and over again, versus um, when you think of the drug trade, you sell a drug once and it's gone. And so traffickers see um, human beings as reusable commodities. And this is being pushed by this neoliberal capitalist model that is constantly looking for increased profits. How can we continue to make more and more profits at the least cost? Um, and this is really pushing a lot of the labor trafficking because in order to minimize cost on the production side, um, they're using slave labor in order to then maximize profit by what's being sold to us. So we have to reduce the demand. Um, reducing the demand on the sex trafficking side looks like um, ending sexism and patriarchy, right? Um, around 90% of the victims of sex trafficking are female. And this is incredibly rooted in a long history of being able to use and abuse the female body. And so this larger work around gender equity um, has to happen if we're gonna be successful in ending human trafficking. And on the labor trafficking side, I think it's a combination again of this economic model and also this colonialist white supremacist mindset that there are certain populations that other populations can use and abuse for their own profit, right? This is the whole history of colonialism and white European uh, expansion and subjugation of native people, peoples uh, in the, the countries that they invaded, right? It's seen both the land and the human beings as commodities and resources that can be used and abused for their own profit. We have to dismantle these systems, right? When we talk about breaking down and building up, again, the theme of this con conference, we have to break down these systems that allow us to think that we can use and abuse another human being in that way, whether it's because of their gender or race or nationality. Okay. What does Catholic social teaching tell us about this issue? The catechism forbids any act leading to the enslavement of human beings, stating that it is a sin against a person's dignity and fundamental rights. The document Gaudium et Spes quoted, slavery, prostitution, the selling of women and children, and disgraceful working conditions where people are treated as mere, as mere tools for profit are infamies and a supreme dishonor to the creator. So we have some really powerful documents in our faith tradition um, that support us in this work to end human trafficking. There are multiple statements and discourses by Pope Francis in particular on ending human trafficking. He is such a strong ally in this work. Um, and the Vatican office under Pope Francis actually created some pastoral orientations on human trafficking for local church groups, but college campuses or high school campuses could certainly use them as well um, that help to orient us into how we engage in this crime and support the survivors in our communities. Okay, the core values of our organization at US Catholic Sisters Against Human Trafficking come from Catholic social teaching. So our belief in the inherent dignity of every person, a commitment to the poor and the vulnerable, establishing right relationships to promote the common good, defense of the basic rights of workers and solidarity with one another. All of these are core tenets of Catholic social teaching and core tenets of our work. I'm nearing the end of my time now, so I want to just briefly say um, our organization, U.S. Catholic Sisters Against Human Trafficking, is a collaborative faith-based national network offering education, supporting access to survivor services, and engaging in advocacy. These are our three main areas of work, education, survivor services, and advocacy. Even though our name is U.S. Catholic Sisters Against Human Trafficking, 
we welcome collaboration with all people. We are a membership-based organization. Um, and while we were founded by congregations of women religious and continue to have over a hundred congregations who make up our membership, we do also partner with individuals, with churches, with coalitions. Um, and just this year, we created new student level memberships. And so we would love to be able to get to know you, to collaborate more, see how we can help you on your college campus campus or in your high school, um, maybe start a group or do some programming to raise awareness about this issue of human trafficking and what students can do to get involved. You can find information about our membership on our website, sistersagainsttrafficking.org, um, which has been at the bottom of all of these slides. It's again at the bottom of this slide. Um, and certainly feel free to reach out to me as well. Um, we are exhibitors for this conference, so please stop by our virtual exhibit table there. You will find our contact information as well as how to find us um, on social media. I'm going to skip ahead to my last slide because we're out of time. So I wanna just end again by reiterating ways to get involved. So we would certainly love to have you become a member of US Catholic Sisters Against Human Trafficking. Um, once a member, you can join one of those three working groups on education, survivor services, or advocacy, um, or if you're more interested in communications or helping us with membership development. Certainly follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Educate others in your settings. Um, learn more about the products that you're buying, be an informed consumer, and please do join us in prayer. Thank you so much for your time, for engaging today, um, and I do hope that you stop by our booth and reach out and contact us if you're interested in getting more involved. Remember that ending slavery is everyone's work. Thank you. <laughs>